Good morning, everyone from Stanford University. My name is Well Chu. I'm the faculty director of the Storage X Initiative at Stanford University. Um, it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome you all to today's seminar. Um, the topic today will be a very exciting and relevant one on sodium ion batteries. Uh, as uh, many of you can appreciate, um, the massive scale up on lithium ion battery has created significant supply chain pressure on both raw materials and also active materials. And the fields uh, both in academia and industry have been looking for alternatives for next generation batteries that will overcome these supply chain challenges. And one of the many technologies being pursued is sodium ion batteries. And I'm extremely delighted today uh, to have two um, industry veterans and also academic uh, experts join me to discuss um, the present states and also the future of sodium ion batteries. So uh, let me first just briefly uh, introduce the two speakers and I'll dive into a deeper introduction uh, next. So uh, speaking first today uh, with us is Dr. Jerry Barker. He is the co-founder and chief scientist of Feridion, uh, a, a company that is uh, commercializing sodium ion batteries. And um, our second speaker is uh, Professor Christian uh, Masquelier, uh, joining us uh, from the University of Garde du Verne in France. And uh, he has been working on uh, sodium ion and lithium ion cathode materials for the past 30 years. So I'm really delighted to have uh, both of them with us today to give us a joint view of sodium ion batteries uh, from the industry side and also from the academic side. So first, uh, let me ask uh, Jerry to join us on the screen here. Hello, Jerry. Good afternoon. Hi there, Will. Um, let me just give a brief introduction of Jerry. Uh, he is a true veteran uh, in the lithium ion battery field um, and also uh, moving forward to next generation technologies. As I mentioned, uh, he is the founder, uh, co-founder and chief scientist at Veridian. Uh, but prior to that, uh, he has more than 30 years of experience developing uh, lithium ion battery materials from the very beginning. Uh, so let me uh, briefly mention his history and also some of the recognitions he has received. Um, for many years, he was the research director at Valence and uh, one of the original developer of lithium ion phosphate technology that is now widely used for electrical uh, electric vehicles and grid storage. And many of the chemistries uh, he has developed, uh, such as carbothermal reduction for the synthesis of LFP, uh, is still widely used and uh, uh, in, in all of today's LFP materials being produced. And he has made many contributions to the field, um, also in the academic settings as well, and published uh, many, many papers and uh, extensive patents uh, in the lithium ion battery areas. Um, one, uh, two notable recognitions for his contribution to the commercialization of lithium ion battery is the IBA Technology Award from the International Battery Association and also receiving the Alessandro Volta Medal um, from the Electrochemical Society. Jerry, we're so delighted to have you to share your experience um, with us in the lithium ion battery field and how this could be extended to sodium ion going forward. Jerry, the floor is yours. All right, thanks very much, Will. I'm just gonna share my slides. Thank you. So. Thanks to, to Will and Jimmy for this uh, very kind introduction and the invitation to present here. And um, as Will said, I am co-founder and chief scientist at uh, Faradian Limited. And the title of my talk, you can see it right here, is The Path to the Successful Commercialization of Sodium Ion Batteries. A bit of background on uh, Faradian itself, you know, we were founded in 2011 so we were we think the first company to look at commercializing sodium ion batteries so it's been it's been a long path already over 10 years so we set out to to to, to develop and develop an ip portfolio and then commercialize sodium ion batteries and for the, for those of you who don't know much about Faradian, we have two facilities in the uk so top left hand corner here, you can see the facility that I normally hang out at, which is um, a shared facility we have at the University of Oxford Science Park 
Bedbrook, so it's just outside Oxford in the south of England. And top right, this is the other facility we have in the UK. It's in the north of England, it's in Sheffield. And these are the company headquarters. So this is again a shared facility. And right now we make all cell formats for sodium ion batteries at a prototype scale. So we make pouch cells, prismatic cells and cylindricals. Just a bit of news I should bring you up to speed with. Um, at the end of 2021, so kind of about 10 months ago, Faradian, Faradian was 100% acquired by Reliance New Energy Limited of India. And Reliance has big plans to, to produce Faradian sodium ion batteries and a new gigafactory in India in the very near future. So that's big news for us. We think that is a big vindication of our technology and a big step forward for Faradian and its sodium ion battery technology. Also, right, some important other news just recently is that IUPAC um, recognized sodium ion batteries as one of the top 10 emerging set technologies in chemistry for 2022. So we, we say, we think again, this is an important recognition for the emerging sodium ion battery uh, industry. So, right, going back to where we started in 2011, you know, why did we look to commercialize sodium ion batteries? Well, we thought initially this was, you know, we, we convinced our investors of this is that sodium ion batteries would be an effective, effective and drop in replacement for lithium ion batteries in many existing applications and also a drop in replacement for some legacy lead acid applications as well. Uh, the manufacturing, right, this is an important point, manufacturing, we knew that we could make our sodium ion batteries using the same manufacturing methods and cell formats as those used in uh, lithium ion batteries. And you'll probably know when you're developing a new battery technology from, from the ground up, you've got to be careful if you develop new manufacturing methods, this is very expensive and very time consuming. So we thought this was a major advantage for this technology. And we've also maintained, right, that if we if you develop new gigafactories and the gigafactories that are designed to produce lithium ion batteries, that these can be easily replaced or supplemented with sodium ion batteries. And just to let you know that pretty well all of our our um, our companies right now are helping us out with these this technology, make our sodium ion battery cells on existing lithium ion cell manufacturing lines. We have improved sustainability. This is kind of no doubt, right? There's, uh, and there's no requirement for the use of resource limited elements, such obviously as lithium, but also as for cobalt and copper, you know, in either the cell chemistry or the cell infrastructure. The copper is an important point. You know, obviously you will know that in graphite lithium ion chemistry cells that uh, you use copper as the negative current collector. In our configuration, we use aluminium, aluminum current collectors on both sides of the cell. And there's a great abundance and availability of low cost sodium salts. And I'll come back to that in, in a few minutes. All this adds up to a much lower bill of materials. And I mean a, a lower bill of materials, both in terms of the energy market, so dollars per kilowatt hour, but also for the power market in dollars per kilowatt. Uh, safety was an important one. You know, we have an intrinsically safer chemistry than would be available for, for lithium ion and uh, also a very low volatility electrolyte. So this ends up giving us improved safety and abuse characteristics. And secondly, in the safety aspect, we have, because we're using aluminium aluminum current collectors both sides of the cell, we can safely store and transport ourselves physically shorted across the terminals. So that means you have um, extremely safe conditions for transportation and, and in particular air transportation. So these cells are all physically shorted across the terminals. Supply chain, we say the supply chain right now is, is generally okay. It's not perfect, but it's okay. And most cell components are, are available through established lithium ion battery technology supply chains. The electrolyte, we have a bit more, um, because we're using uh, different active materials, we have slightly more latitude in what uh, electrolyte solvents we can use. So that ends up giving us improved 
temperature performance, both at the low end and the high end. And lastly, we maintain now, right, what I tell you know, our investors and Reliance and, and, and whoever in the industry is, look, you know, sodium ion batteries is going to be a commercial success. It's no matter of question on whether it's going to be a success. It will be. It just now is the question is how much of the market sodium ion batteries will garner from, as I say, lithium ion and uh, some lead acid applications. So just giving you some basics on the chemistry. So around choices, active choices per cathode, you know, for ferradium, we, we use the layered oxide. And schematically, I'm showing you a certain structural type, O3 layered oxide. But you've also got uh, the possibility of using things called Prussian blue analog or Prussian white analog materials. Or just like you can in the lithium space, you can use polyanions like phosphate materials. On the anode, um, unless you make modifications to the electrolyte, you generally can't use um, crystalline graphite as, as the active material on the negative side. So you have to end up using some kind of disordered carbon, and that generally is, is a hard carbon material. For certain applications, it's also possible, again, like lithium ion, that you can use titanate active materials or, or, or conversion alloy materials. And these may well end up being second generation materials for here. The electrolyte is analogous to what you'd use for the, in the lithium space. So it's, again, from a commercial standpoint, most companies are using um, NAPF6, the sodium version of obviously LIPF6, in a mixture of cyclic and aliphatic carbonates. I make the point here that um, one of those uh, cyclic carbonates that you can use is propylene carbonate. Can't use that in the lithium space because of the exfoliation problem with graphite, but that ends up giving you better, um, it gives you a lower volatility electrolyte and better uh, liquid range. And just to remind you again that we use, we use aluminium, aluminum current collectors on both sides of the cell. You know, what drove us to, 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 um, to using sodium initially was this great abundance. You know, we don't need to go into this too much. We kind of know this, right? You compare the, 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 the earth abundance of sodium over lithium, it's, it's uh, you know, sodium is the sixth most abundant element in the Earth's crust. We'll never run out of sodium. You can extract the material easily from, obviously, from seawater. So we, we started out with the idea that it would be possible to produce sodium ion batteries anywhere in the world using, using local materials. And most importantly, right, is we all kind of know this now, is in terms of the precursor costs, if we compare the cost what's happened over the last maybe five years of lithium carbonate, I think we're all aware of that uh, price increase that lithium carbonate now is running. This is battery grade, high specification lithium carbonate. It's running somewhere between 60, 70,000 uh, 70, dollars per metric ton. It's extremely expensive. I never would have believed that cost 10 years ago, but that's the current cost. You compare that with the cost of equivalent grade, uh, high specification sodium carbonate, and sodium carbonate is down at the, at the hundreds of dollars per metric ton. So two or 300 US dollars per ton. That makes a huge difference in terms of the, then the bill of materials because lithium carbonate or, or, or sometimes lithium hydroxide obviously is the precursor material for making a lot of the, the cathode active materials. That same point goes with uh, what's happening with sodium carbonate in the sodium space. So there's a massive difference in the precursor costs. And I guess we also know what's happened to the cost of cobalt, nic cobalt and nickel over the, um, over the last kind of couple of years as well. Supply chain, I kind of mentioned that the supply chain I thought was kind of reasonable uh, for, um, for most of the, uh, the materials that we use in a sodium ion cell. Just to remind you, right, in terms of cathode, you know, we've got this choice of layered oxide, Prussian blue, Prussian white, and polyanions. And it, it's fair to say that all the commercial companies really are making these materials either in-house or under license. So there is an opportunity for the large lithium ion cathode suppliers to enter this market because there, there will be a big requirement for this cathode active material as we move forward. In terms of anode active, I said to you that most people are using hard carbon and there are several, you know, two to three maybe 
commercial suppliers of large amounts of, of hard carbon. And hard carbon was originally uh, manufactured for the, for the, for the lithium ion industry. Um, there is small scale operations for manufacturing of hard carbon in Europe and in the US. But uh, because of the requirements, the, 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 uh, the performance requirements, the morphology requirements are slightly different for, for sodium applications over lithium applications. Some of the companies, including Faradian, are making proprietary versions of this hard carbon in-house. And that gives a benefit in the overall performance. Electrolyte salts, really pretty well everyone is using NAPF6. And there are only two or three global suppliers of NAPF6 battery grade in the world. If you use non-battery grade, then you get all kinds of other issues in terms of insolubles. So I think there's, a, there's, an, obvious, um, there's an obvious requirement for more companies to enter the supply chain for things like NAPF6. And I'd also add that we need alternative salts to NAPF6. I've got in parentheses there, on the left-hand side that there's these imide salts, the equivalent to what is available in the lithium space, so TFSI and FSI. You know, why those are in parentheses is because you can't use those generally with the layered oxide materials because at high voltage, the voltages um, that these cathode materials operate at, you get uh, problems with uh, the corrosion of the aluminum current collector. So there's a problem there. Um, in terms of the other components in the cell, the electrolyte solvents, additives, current collectors, binders, and, and the rest of the infrastructure, pretty well all available from current lithium ion suppliers. So that, that's good for the industry. Cathode choices, just to give you a summary on these cathode choices, right? So I said there's basically three classes. Uh, so the first one, Prussian blue, Prussian white analog materials. Several companies worldwide are looking at this to, to commercialize. Uh, Natron Energy there in California, that's a Stanford spin out, doing a great job in developing a chemistry on, um, on Prussian blue analog materials. Ultras in Sweden. And now, you know, a new entrant in the last couple of years has been CATL, who are apparently looking at uh, developing um, a sodium ion cell chemistry based on, on, on Prussian. Uh, Prussian blue analog materials. The problem with these for an energy application is that these materials generally have a pretty low tap density. So they've got good power, they've got good lifetimes. If they're based on iron or manganese, they have low cost, but the low tap density and the low true density of these materials generally makes them unsuitable for making um, high aerial capacity electrodes. So I think they're better suited to power applications, not so suited to high energy applications. The same can be true to some extent with the sodium polyanions. And um, Christian's gonna do a great job, I'm sure, in giving you much more information on uh, the polyanion systems. Um, Tiamat in, Fran in France is doing a great job in developing the sodium vanadium fluorophosphate material, Na3V2PO42F3, cathode active material, material both Christian and I have looked at for many years. And um, again, this material is, is extremely good for high power applications. It has very good rate capability, but because it's a phosphate, it has relatively low tap density and is not always great for, for energy applications, but I'll draw your attention to, to Christian's presentation after mine. Um, so really, if you're looking at uh, entering the, the energy market for sodium ion batteries, you're pretty well um, confined to using one of the sodium layered oxides. And uh, of the companies that are trying to commercialize sodium layered oxides, we include obviously Faradian, Haina battery in China. And now we, we kind of hear that probably CATL will also be looking at uh, developing a layered oxide chemistry as well. And if you make this, these materials correctly with the right uh, substitutions and the right uh, physical properties, then you can end up with materials with relatively high density, uh, high specific energy and very good lifetimes. So all those things together mean that you can, you know, with the, with the high density means you can 
you can formulate electrodes with high aerial capacity, which are then suitable for, um, for energy applications. I'll draw your, draw your attention to the fact also that um, the sodium layered oxides, it allows you much more flexibility in the structural types that you can use, much more than you can have in the lithium space. All of the lithium materials that are currently used, NMC and NCA, belong to the O3 structural type. But in, in sodium layered oxides, because of the change in the, the ionic radii of the, of the sodium ion, you can also make uh, materials called P2 and P3 materials. And in fact, what, uh, what Faradian has done is taken advantage of this flexibility and formulated many um, uh, biphasic materials, mixed phase cathode active materials that give you this benefit of the O3 and the P2 structures. And this going on to that, right, this is a biphasic material that Faradin is currently using in its energy applications. And until, until recently, this material was made by our corporate investor, Halder Topso from, from Denmark. And for those of you who don't know much about Halder Topso, they are a, um, a very large uh, catalyst company specializing in, in nickel catalysts. So they have a lot of expertise around uh, the handling of, of nickel, nickel inorganic materials, both from a chemical and a physical standpoint. And uh, they make in large quantities our, our mixed phase, biphasic uh, uh, layered oxide cathode material. And in our current design, one of the typical materials we used is, is shown here. And under micrographs, you look at these under micrographs, what you see is, um, they're made from, uh, you know, the agglomerates are made from smaller uh, primary particle sizes. The agglomerates are somewhere between 10 and 20 microns in diameter. Uh, these end up giving you pretty good tap density. If you look at it under much more high magnification, you get these, these intergrowth materials. And this allows you to get um, the synergistic positive effects of the O3 and the P2. And when we first saw these micrographs, typically the one on the right hand side, you know, we call this one on the right the, the burger structure, where what we basically have here is, is the O3 layered oxide as the kind of bun part of the burger, and then and then the patty being the P2. We also have the reverse situation in this in this micrograph shown in, in the center. And this particular biphasic material is around about two thirds O3, one third P2. And that gives us this, this, this benefit of, um, of high power capability, but also good high energy density as well. And to, to illustrate that, these, uh, these voltage profiles here, the center one in B shows the voltage profile in a sodium metal half cell. And you can probably see there, right, we're, de we're, we're delivering a reversible specific capacity of approaching 160 milliamp hours per gram. For those of you who are not kind of sure about what that means, that's kind of typical, a kind of similar figure in terms of milliamp hours per gram specific capacity to what you would get from a lithium iron phosphate uh, cathode material in lithium iron. On the right hand side, we're showing here that same cathode material incorporated in a full sodium iron cell with a hard carbon anode. And even with this configuration, we're showing at full depth of discharge, a reversible specific capacity of over 150 milliamp hours per gram. That's really excellent performance, right? And the operating voltage of that cell, you can probably see the average voltage is about 3.1 volts for the cell voltage. So, so really excellent performance from the, the cathode active. In terms of uh, the hard carbon materials, I said to you most of the negative active materials are, are based on hard carbon. If you just take a, a commercial hard carbon, one of the, the, the hard carbons that uh, was originally developed for the lithium ion space, it gives you a pretty good performance in a half cell, right? You get close to 300 milliamp hours per gram. But we've looked at huge numbers of precursors and different synthesis methods to make hard carbons. And um, if you know that the requirements are slightly different for, for sodium applications over lithium applications, you can develop hard carbons that give you superior performance to the commercial versions, shown you here, one made by Faradian. So we're running up 
at a reversible specific capacity in a half cell of 330 milliamp hours per gram with good uh, charge efficiency in the first cycle. 330 milliamp hours per gram is very similar to what you would what would get delivered from a from a, a good crystalline graphite in a lithium ion application. So it's it's good performance. Uh, electrolyte development. I think I said to you earlier that this is maybe one of the areas where it needs additional work, right? So everyone in the industry is pretty well looking at the, you know, uh, the use of NaPF6 in a mixture of kind of carbonate based uh, solvents. Well, we talked to our friends at the Faraday Institution. It's a government run um, initiative in the UK and the University of Cambridge about ways that we might be able to supplement the delivery of NAPF6. And Cambridge University did a really nice job in going out and looking at the, the synthesis methods that are, that are in the literature for making NAPF6 and concluded quite rightly, I think, that pretty well all of the, the methods were pretty complicated and expensive to implement. You know, again, they generally require the use of, of things like HF. The other alternative is to simply sodium ion exchange LIPF6, but that seemed to be a pretty negative way of going because LIPF6 is, a, is an expensive material. We're maintaining that sodium ion cells should be low cost. So if you take L LIPF6 and add another process step, that just makes it even more expensive. So the guys at Cambridge did a great job in developing a new synthesis method by by finding a low cost commercially available pre precursor, ammonium PF6, and then using sodium metal, in this case, two equivalents of sodium metal over the stoichiometric amount, refluxing, refluxing it in, in an organic solvent like THF and, and having a quantitative delivery of NAPF6 in high purity. So this was a really nice uh, piece of work. And you know, we think this is a scalable process. We took that material at Faradin and made those, made those, took the NAPF6 and made that into, into electrolyte systems and compared it with electrolytes made with the same solvents, but with commercial NAPF6 and basically showed no difference. This right hand side shows the testing of four cells at uh, plus minus C upon, C upon five rate and showed no difference in performance or rate capability. So going on to some of our full cell testing. So here we've, we've got several companies, our sister companies around the world that are making uh, prototype uh, pouch and prismatic cells based on our cell chemistry. So these are some cycling results from, you know, we just picked these out. We've got, obviously got a great many examples, but these are typical results from 10 amp power pouch cells running at plus minus C upon five, or plus minus C upon three for charge and discharge. And we're running them at different depths of discharge. 4.2 to one volt is basically 100% depth of discharge. And I'll just draw your attention to the fact that, hey, two things here. One, this cycles with very low capacity fade at 100% depth of discharge. And that the cathode at these relatively good rates of charge and discharge is still delivering 140 milliamp hours per gram specific capacity reversibly. That's a really good result. Because we were, we were challenged when we first did this work, most people said, well, one of the problems you guys will have is combining high specific energy performance in your energy products and delivering high cycle life. Well, we kind of knew that if we were gonna go head to head against things like graphite, lithium iron phosphate, we would need both of these things, right? So in terms of specific energy, our, our rate of progress and development has been pretty good. Left hand side, I'm showing the rate of progress of in the green line of Faradian production cells. So right now we're running at about 160 watt hours per kilogram, which is the, the kind of gray dots on here are comparing that with LFP commercial, LFP graphite commercial cells from several sources. So these are, this is a very similar performance. And so that's really an extremely good performance in terms of specific energy. And then on the right hand side of this chart, we're showing the cycle life. And here we're charging and discharge. There's prototype cells and there's production cells running at pretty high rates. And you can probably see here, right, that we're out to 4,000 cycles. 
and that's still above 80% of the original discharge capacity. That puts us similar, I think, to, to really good uh, graphite LFP cells in the lithium ion space. Big advantage for us, and we claimed this when we started this work, was because of the intrinsic safety of the sodium ion chemistry, we should get better safety abuse uh, characteristics. And we've done huge numbers of testing on all kinds of uh, sizes of cell and also using different um, testing protocols for the safety. So we, we're showing IEC testing here, but we've also done UL and UNDOT and we've never had any incident. So just shown on the right hand side, they're right, a crush test on the top and the nail penetration on the bottom. But we've had no problems with any of the tests, including the crush and hot box and nail penetration. Really important for us, and I think a, a differentiator over any graphite based lithium ion cell is that we can store and transport our cells at zero volts. I said that at the start of the presentation. One of the advantages of, of having aluminum aluminum current collectors both sides of the cell is we can physically short the cells for, for storage and transportation with no detriment. There's no increase in impedance. There's no uh, detriment, detriment in terms of cell performance. And right now, everything that we, we, um, we store and transport for good safety reasons is physically shorted across the terminals. So this we think is a major advantage over any um, lithium ion uh, cell chemistry that uses graphite at least, ones that use um, a copper current collector. And if you, I'll just draw your attention, I haven't got a lot of time to show you the data, but I'll draw your attention. If you need more information on this, then I refer you to a, a review article that we wrote about a year ago where we compared the, the shipping of lithium ion and sodium ion cells from a materials chemistry perspective. It's got a lot of good data in there, so I draw your attention to that. You know, one thing we're really pleased about at Faraday, and I said we've been going for 11 years, we've been making prototype cells since about 2015. What we show here on the left-hand side is we're comparing ourselves with the rate of progress in terms of specific energy for what happened in the lithium ion space. And these are the red dots are what's happened for commercial 18650 type cells. So we all know that, you know, Sony kicked off this, this work on lithium ion commercially in 1991 with a, with a you know, low specific energy cell, but that's, that was the start point. And you can see the rate of progress that's happened over those intervening years. Well, the green line here, down here, is what's happened for Faradian. So because we've all come within, within Faradium, we've already come, come from a lithium ion background, we've used our experience to kind of aid the development and reduce the, the timeline. So I'm saying right now, you know, we're running at a very accelerated time frame, and um, our current prototype cells are about 160 watt hour per kilogram, but we're predicting confidently that there's no indication that this trend of, it, of, of growth will, will stop and that we should get to over 200 watt hours per kilogram in the next two years. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's with no change in the cell chemistry, by the way. We'll be keeping the same chemistry, but just engineering the cell in a, in a more efficient way to get to higher watt hours per kilogram. If we can get over 200 watt hours per kilogram, we move ourselves into a position where we're not far short of the the performance, the specific energy performance and energy density performance for NMC and NCA. So we will do that obviously at lower cost and better safety. And you might say to us, right, well, that's all well, well, well and good, right? Just saying you're gonna to get to 200 watt hours per kilogram and beyond. But how do you think you might do that? Well, we have a lot of ways we're doing that right now. One of them is very simple, incredibly simple is that the larger cells you can make, and obviously because we have better safety characteristics, we can make bigger, larger format cells than is available for lithium iron. So as you increase the, the cell capacity and the cell energy, you, get, uh, um, you also get improvements in the packing efficiency of, of that cell. So that incre increases the specific energy in a very simple way. Secondly, electrolyte loading. And generally speaking, we kind of measure that in the lithium ion or, or sodium ion battery industry 
in how many grams per amp hour of electrolyte you add. And right now, and it's if you develop a new cell chemistry, this is pretty well maybe one of the last things that you fully develop. But um, we know that there's a good way for us to go in terms of optimizing the grams per amp hour uh, of electrolyte that we use. And if we get that down to where we need to be, that that has a benefit, not just in, in boosting the specific energy, but also is a, a very handy cost saving because electrolyte now is, is pretty costly. Simple way again also is increasing the thickness of the, of the electrodes. So this is, this is, as I said earlier, getting to high aerial capacity electrodes. So this is generally measured in milliamp hours per square centimeter. So we're moving that ahead at all, at all times. If you, if you can get to high aerial capacity, then you, you get better packing efficiency and you need less layers in, in the cell. Electrode formulation is you get to higher active loadings of the active materials in the electrodes. And we're doing that right now. And as we're showing in this chart, our cathode active is running at 96%. So we push that ahead and we're still pushing that ahead in, in both cathode and active. And lastly, you have to optimize the electrode density. This is, this is in, in, in grams per, per, per cubic centimeter generally. And that comes down to how you control the porosity by, by pressure calendaring the electrodes. You have to get that right also to boost the specific energy. Cost analysis, we keep this under constant review and we compare ourselves at Faradium with the best that commercial LFP graphite can do. And obviously this is a moving target. Things are changing all the time. As I said to you earlier, the cost of the lithium precursors going up is actually working to our advantage. Right now, we are suggesting that for energy cells against commercial LFB graphite, we're around about 30% less in bill of materials in terms of dollars per kilowatt hour than, uh, than the, the, the lithium iron phosphate graphite. So that's a very handy saving. Uh, for Adian's IP status, I kind of mentioned this in passing at the start, you know, we've the first few years that we were working in, in this space, we were kind of basically a, a, a an IP factory, and we've got IP and know-how that covers everything from the very basic material IP, so the active materials and electrolyte formulations, all the way through to, to BMS and pack design. And I'll just draw your attention to the fact that we also include here that we've got IP covering the zero volt uh, storage and transportation of sodium ion cells, which I think is as you're probably aware, a very valuable piece of IP. Who are the world leaders in sodium iron, right? We're not the only ones. I've kind of focused a lot on Faradian, obviously, but there's several other companies out there doing a, doing a really great job. And I think we don't consider ourselves to be that, you know, in a, in a competitive environment against these, these companies. I, I still think we're all work working together to develop the sodium iron market. So Faradian, obviously, you know, we're based in the UK, layered oxide, hard carbon chemistry, and we're trying to attack all energy and power markets, right? So renewables, telecoms, and even moving forward to battery electric vehicles. That will require us to get to higher watt hour per kilogram figures, but that's exactly what we're doing. I mentioned Tiamat, and I think uh, Christian will mention Tiamat as well in his presentation. They're doing a great job. Their Gen 1 chemistry is around power market. It's based on the, the uh, NVPF material I mentioned earlier. It's a really good from, as I say, power, so power tools and e-bus. And what they've announced recently is their Gen 2 chemistry will be around the layered oxide cathode chemistry. So that will allow them to look at energy applications, you know, battery electric vehicle, vehicles and stationary applications as well. High now battery in China have a very similar chemistry to the one that Faradian's developing. So it's around layered oxide and hard carbon. So no big surprise, they're looking at uh, the energy market and some power market as well. Natron Energy, you know, good friends of ours. They're, they're, they're the guys in California, the Stanford spin out. You know, I think they're doing an absolutely fantastic job in developing a chemistry where it's all around Prussian blue analog materials. So, so iron and manganese based Prussian blue analog materials. When you do that, right, you move away from a hard carbon on the negative, that's gonna give you obviously a 
uh, a much lower specific energy. So it's much lower. It's, 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 it's kind of more around the lead acid market, but it has an extraordinarily good uh, cycle life and rate performance. So this means there's really good applications for the Natron Energy um, uh, uh, products around behind the meter applications grid. I know data centers is a really big market for them. And just, I think two days ago, I saw another announcement from Natron saying that they'd signed, signed an agreement with United Airlines around what they're gonna do on the, around kind of ground transportation applications. So that's really great for them. Uh, Ultris, again, good friends of ours in Sweden are developing and doing a really nice job in developing Prussian white analog and iron-based Prussian white analog cathode material. If they go ahead and combine that with our carbon, it gives a pretty good performance again around, especially around kind of grid and stationary and large format applications. And lastly, you know, one we can't avoid because it's the biggest entrant we've seen in the last couple of years, and it's it's really kind of buoyed up the sodium market, I think, is that CATL announced that they would be entering and actually going into production next year, 2023. And they originally announced that this would be around a Prussian white analog, an iron-based Prussian white analog cathode, around a hard carbon negative. And we kind of think this would be maybe complementary to their lithium iron phosphate products. They've also announced that they might end up using cell packs with a mixture of lithium and sodium uh, ion batteries. That's an interesting application. They're, they're claiming that their specific energy is similar to, to Faradian's. It ran 160 watt hours per kilogram. That's yet to be confirmed in, in products, but we'll see what happens. And we think now that they're looking at layered oxides as maybe also maybe a, um, a replacement for Prussian white analog to get to the high specific energy. And I, you know, I'm not bothering to note to mention there's a lot of other small startups also now available in, in China and India. So we'll, we'll, we'll watch what happens there. And just within the last couple of day, days, I, I see that there's unconfirmed reports that maybe BYD are going to enter the sodium ion space as well. So I'll just leave you with some closing thoughts on where we need to be, I think, in sodium ion is, um, you know, sodium ion batteries will be commercially successful, I think, right? We know that's going to happen now. All we've got to do now is figure out how big the market will be. You know, Faradian, we believe, has a world leading sodium ion battery performance, and I've talked about that already. Our specific energy performance is pretty similar to LFP graphite, but at a lower bill of materials. Our technology roadmap, I think without changing the cell chemistry, we can target a specific, specific energy of over 200 watt hours per kilogram. And, you know, hey, next stage, we're, we're all thinking about what's going to be the next stage, maybe all solid state sodium ion batteries perhaps even anode free. And I know CATL have announced that that is part of their, their technology roadmap. For Adian, we have a world leading IP position. Um, you know, the other commercial companies are also progressing well in this space. We're kind of differentiated in terms of cell chemistry, but I think we're all working, working together to develop the sodium ion market worldwide. There's a few remaining challenges that need to be looked at. You know, we've got to improve cycle life. We need maybe some more electrolyte choices. We've maybe got to improve active materials. Um, I said about supply chain, maybe that needs more attention. We've got to push ahead, get some of the bigger companies looking at supplying some of the active materials. Also, we need um, new supply lines for electrolyte salts, such as the NAPF6. But I'll just leave you with the message that, hey, sodium ion batteries are here commercially. We just got to figure out where we go from here. And uh, on that uh, note, I'll uh, and thank you and, and maybe uh, throw it over for some questions. Jerry, thank you so much for that uh, overview of the field and introduction of Feridian's technologies. Really appreciate it. Uh, we have time for, for just a few questions. Um, Maybe let me lead with the high-level question first. So you have shown toward the end of your talk that the performance learning curve is very attractive for sodium ion, um, essentially doubling that of lithium ion. And, and I think this is extremely exciting. Can you comment a little bit on the prospect of the cost learning curve? For, for cost, Will? 
for the cost learning curve. So you mentioned about the performance learning yeah. curve. How yeah. about the cost learning curve? That's going to be an interesting one, right? I think it. I think it depends a bit on the cell chemistry. Will I think you know in terms of our cell chemistry? I can comment on what we're doing, right? Um, our cathode material, the biggest cost part, as you'll probably see in that one slide, is very similar to lithium ion, right? It's the active materials are the biggest heavy are the heaviest hitters in the in the bill of materials. So it goes in terms of cathode active is the is the most costly then anode active, and then the electrolyte. Um, we're very efficient in terms of comparisons with things like NMC and NCA. We're very efficient in terms of how much nickel we have in our cathode formulation. So the, the, the B site, if you, if you will, is only one third occupied by nickel. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing to bring that cost down is trying to be even more efficient with, with use of things like nickel because we know what's happening in the market. I showed that slide where both cobalt and nickel costs have been going up. So we're driving that down. We're looking at being more efficient and even longer term will moving to the holy grail. And I think this will be the holy grail of removing nickel completely from the cathode. And so that, but that's very non-trivial because then you end up with having a cathode chemistry that's where the active redox sites are probably only going to be iron and manganese. I'm sure you're aware of the of the issues that, that are associated with using those in the lithium ion space. It, it's non-trivial, very difficult. Um, I think also the anode, you know, right now, I think what we're doing in Faradian is, is as we as we build up the, the, the volume of making higher carbon, we're looking at very low costs precursor materials, like waste materials, biomass materials for making the hard carbon. The hard carbon, if you buy it commercially right now, is a bit more expensive than natural and synthetic graphite in dollars per kilogram. We've got to bring that down as well. Thank you, Jerry. Um, you know, I think this is a, a very critical point. Um, I think what you have shown today is the performance parity has already been reached. Uh, between the sodium ion uh, with the layer oxides and versus say lithium iron phosphate graphite. I, I think it's very much without a doubt. I think now I'm looking forward to when the cost parity would be achieved uh, at scale. And that I think it's um it's the big question. Um, I think you're right. The graphite you're is right. continuing to come down as well and yeah. you're intercepting it. And I am confident that the slope be sharper but nonetheless, I think the big question mark is, is when uh, the cost. I think you're absolutely right. This, this, is, this is the exciting stuff for, for us, though, Will. When, when Reliance acquired Faradian, one of the big benefits, right, is, is they, have, they have very big plans for taking this to the, to the gigafactory scale. I think that will be the crucial bit. And I think also we're, in, we're all intrigued in the industry by what's going to happen with CATL. You know, when they introduce their first product, let's assume it is going to be next year. I think I think that's going to be, you know, from a from a from a price standpoint, it's going to be very interesting how they differentiate between their 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 super efficient and and uh, very low cost lithium iron phosphate products. Where's the sodium going to fit in that in that market? I think that's going to be very interesting. We're assuming it's going to be complementary. You know, I don't know. I don't know. And they're talking about mixing, you know, sodium and lithium ion cells in the pack. That's going to be interesting as well. Yeah, this would be very exciting to watch here. I think I myself have been surprised yeah. at how quickly LFP has uh, come to become a dominating force just over yeah. the past five years. Um, yeah. so I think something similar may be occurring soon uh, with sodium ion as well. It'd be very Let's interesting. Hope so. Let's hope so, Will. Thank you, Jerry. Now, I do have one more specific question from the audience. Okay. Um, you very nicely showed, I think you termed the hamburger uh, approach. Uh, yeah. So obviously, this is uh, far more than just a blended electrode. It is. Yeah. But is there any um, reaction between the two phases or they are just microstructurally sort of uh, uh, co-precipitated uh, um, uh, variants of, uh, of that? Yeah, it's... Uh... What we did originally, well, just putting the background, is we, we, we said, well, 
is a, is an intergrowth structure different just from a physical mixture, right? So we went out and made what we could as close as we could to the equivalent material by by physically mixing O3 and P2, and we never got the same performance. Mm. So the intergrowth, just like I think with the the mixed phase materials that you see in the lithium ion space, you know the Li2 MN MnO3 materials, and I think there's a there's a big there's a synergy from using the the intergrowth structures. So, and Jerry, do you think that uh, synergy is coming from an interfacial interaction or more of a mechanical interaction? It, tough to know, Will. We don't know at this point. What we do know is from, from just simple measurements between the two that the physical mixture is not equivalent to what we call as the chemical mixture, mm -hmm. the, the intergrowth phases. So, um, but it's, it's a very powerful, it's, we didn't go into it in great detail, Will, but you can by by altering the synthesis conditions move from from with the same precursor right move from very high o3 contents to very high p2 contents and that takes you from basically an energy material to a power material from the same precursor mix it's a very powerful it's a very powerful kind of matrix i agree thank you jerry <laughs> uh uh, sit tight. Uh, we'll have uh, uh, okay. Christian present next, and then we'll come back for a short discussion afterward. So okay, thanks, uh, if I can have you join the stage, please. Thank you very much. Um, it is, again, our great pleasure to have uh, Professor Christian Masquelier uh, give a talk today uh, on sodium ion cathode chemistry coming from the solid state chemistry perspective. And um, Christian really requires no introduction, um, especially to us academics, uh, have done pioneering work on polyanion since his uh, postdoctoral work with John Goodenough um, some 30 years ago at UT Austin. And since then, uh, Christian has been utilizing powerful probes uh, to understand the synthesis aging pathways of, um, of various cathode materials. And we're extremely excited to have him follow Jerry to give a deep dive into the crystal chemistry. Um, I want to mention that uh, in addition to his expertise um, in cathode solid state chemistry, he has also been uh, providing great service to the, um, the battery community. Uh, he is now the co-director of the Alice Store, which is a large European initiative um, to cut cross cut uh, the European Union for battery research. Um, Christian, we're so delighted to have you uh, give a deep dive here on the solid state chemistry. Uh, really looking forward to your talk. <clears throat> thank you very much, Will, and thank you very much. Can you see my slides correctly? Yes, it looks perfect. Thank you. Okay, good. So it's a real pleasure for me to, to discuss about uh, polyanionic cathodes for sodium ion batteries. Thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, I work in Amiens in France, north of France. And this work is in a very strong collaboration with uh, Bordeaux, the ICMCB in Bordeaux, uh, many colleagues from there, and also for part of the work with uh, uh, NUS, New National University of Singapore, as well as uh, the Tiamat company in France. <clears throat> as uh, Jerry, a very good friend of mine, uh, introduced uh, just before, yes, indeed, there are several interesting families of cathodes for sodium ion batteries, the layered oxides in one part, the Prussian blue white analogs on the other part, and the phosphate based sodium ion cathode materials. This is what I'm working on. Uh, and you see here are two interesting compositions, Na3V2PO4 three times on one side, and it's really two PO4 two times F3 on the other side. Just want to point out first that these two compounds, although uh, their <clears throat> chemical uh, compositions look very similar, they are indeed uh, very, very different in terms of structure, in terms of properties, etc. And my talk will be uh, divided in these two structural families of materials that both contain vanadium at uh, three plus oxidation state to start with. If, you, if we look at the global picture of uh, sodium ion battery cathodes, 
there are plenty, plenty, plenty of uh, materials, compounds we, we may think of, and you are all familiar, I guess, with these voltage capacity plots. Just to mention that uh, cation, uh, polyanion materials are in this range of uh, energy densities, uh, close to 400 to 500, if we consider the Nasicon type and NVP versus the NVPF type of family of materials, which show higher voltage when more or less similar uh, global capacity. The layer oxides uh, Jerry talked about uh, have bigger specific capacities and some of them very nice uh, voltage ranges, so which basically leads to higher energy density for uh, the layered oxides. <clears throat> so the menu of today is the following. I will be talking about uh, NVPF first, and then I will move on to Nasicon type uh, materials. And uh, I like to give somehow the main results I would like to demonstrate in my talk as an introduction. Uh, NVPF, as you will see, is, a, and Jerry mentioned it, is a very, very high rate material. Actually, Jerry Barker worked uh, very early on these compounds and even showed it uh, to be used in lithium ion cells quite a bit of time ago. I will show that uh, the crystal chemistry is really fascinating and we discovered a very subtle orthorhombic distortion that uh, is indeed important to qualify the material and to qualify the stoichiometry. And in particular, as I will demonstrate, the oxygen versus fluorine ratio in this compound that plays a very important role. Uh, as you will see, this is a pretty fast ionic ion transport compound, and this leads to a very important property of this compound in, when it is used in a sodium battery, which means the, the power capability of the cells that will, will be built on NVPF. We made the uh, operando X-ray under different conditions at different temperatures and at different C rates to show indeed that it has really exceptional properties. And not to mention that <clears throat> uh, around NVPF, there are several patents and licenses that have been taken by uh, Tiamat company in particular, with uh, many patents made in France through the RS2 network and with the CEA. So <clears throat> our story with NVPF started uh, close to 10 years ago, actually, we synthesized this material. It's rather easy to synthesize, I would say, and made many tests with uh, Rosa Palatin from uh, ICMAB in Barcelona. And we immediately realized the main feature being that uh, it really can sustain very, very high rates at the very early stages of our uh, work on this compound. So this was 10 years ago. And so this uh, led us to, to really start to work on it uh, deeper and in much details as I will demonstrate. But myself, uh, I'm more of a crystal chemist and I like to look at small little details in the materials we prepare. And NVPF is really fascinating in this sense. Uh, first of all, um, we illustrate here that uh, the compounds, when synthesized in the proper way, that means with uh, three fluorine per formula unit, is indeed uh, showing a very, very subtle phase transformation, phase dis or distortion, lattice distortion towards an orthorhombic symmetry that can be clearly seen in red here, where uh, we could identify that indeed uh, what had been previously described in the literature was not completely true. And uh, we indeed uh, protected this new orthorhombic phase uh, with a very subtle distortion with, a, as you can see, a difference of 1.002 in the B over A ratio of this uh, small orthorhombic distortion. This uh, <clears throat> structure is interesting and uh, this orthorhombic form due to partial ordering on sodium and the crystallographic sites can be disordered by slightly increasing the temperature up to 400 K, where the transformation from the orthorhombic space group AMMM to the I4 MMM space group occurs close to 400 K, above 400 K. So this uh, illustrates the very, very fast ion transport of sodium that is completely delocalized in layers perpendicular to the C parameter. That allows very, very fast diffusion of sodium into this compound. Second uh, fascinating thing is about the fact that 
we can uh, somehow tune uh, the electrochemical properties by playing with the fluorine over oxygen ratio into this compound. Uh, I mentioned already that the orthorhombic phase of F3 is uh, properly described, but uh, with uh, different synthesis conditions, playing with the oxidation states of the vanadium precursors, for instance, we can obtain uh, fl oxygen fl substituted fluorinated compounds with a whole range of Y values. And because oxygen actually substitutes uh, fluorine in this uh, crystallographic sites around vanadium. So this uh, creates shorter vanadium oxygen bonds, uh, both on the, the two sides of the two uh, crystallographic sites for vanadium. So basically we can end up <clears throat> with a compound that has one fluorine and two oxygen around the vanadium. This is clearly seen from uh, X-ray diffraction. We see clearly that depending on the amount of oxygen that has been substituted into fluorine, the structure changes and the lattice distortions of the orthorhombic cell changes and we can really somehow, thanks to precise crystallography and precise uh, X-ray diffraction, monitor and uh, measure somehow the amount of oxygen we have been able to substitute for fluorine. We made a very clear uh, uh, tables of evolutions of the lattice parameters as a function of uh, Y in the fluorinated, oxygenated, substituted samples. And you can see that as soon as we reach 0 0.5 oxygen, uh, basically the structure is not orthorhombic anymore and transforms to uh, a tetragonal unit cell. Depending on the amount of fluorine versus oxygen, uh, they, the compounds show also different thermal behaviors. The phase transformation from the AMM uh, orthorhombic space group to the tetragonal I4 MMM takes place at slightly different temperatures. So this is, uh, is also a way to quantify the amount of oxygen in a given cathode, I would say, for this family. And also the energy related to this transformation is uh, depending on the oxygen versus uh, fluorine ratio. As I mentioned, it is possible to prepare a whole series of compounds with different fluorine to oxygen ratio here, FO2. So that means that indeed the vanadium oxidation state changes quite, quite a bit. And uh, we might be carefully not actually saying that we have vanadium 4 plus, but we have more of VO2 plus units that are formed when we substitute fluorine by oxygen. You see that basically the electrochemical properties are similar, but they are not uh, in details because you see very characteristics two phase transformations from uh, the stoichiometric compounds with F3, similar. Uh, clearly defined two-phase transformations occur for the FO2 compounds while we have a much more continuous evolution of the voltage versus composition uh, figures when we have intermediate compositions. This is a, a general trend and also what is important is that uh, as the fluorine content increases into this structure, this increases uh, slightly the average operating voltage from 4.04 .04 here to 4.20 and similar for the first uh, intercalation plateau. <clears throat> then we spent a lot, a lot of time over these uh, at least six, seven years uh, by doing uh, structural studies, in particular the Alba synchrotron in uh, close to Barcelona in Spain, with our colleague Francois Faut to investigate the, the mechanism of sodium insertion extraction. Uh, it happens that uh, the while we the mechanism look simple from the voltage composition shapes with two separate features here we were indeed able to identify many intermediate stages of sodium extraction with many intermediate phases characterized by different X-ray diffraction patterns. So this is rather fascinating. I mean, sodium orders, vanadium charges order as well. Very, very complex actually phase diagram occurs upon extraction of sodium from NA3 here. To NA1. This was basically a great work of uh, Matteo Bianchini during his PhD thesis a long time ago. 
and uh, Thibaut Bro, who worked uh, with us for a long time as well. <clears throat> so several features are pretty interesting in terms of crystal chemistry. Uh, when we fully extract sodium from Na3 to Na1 here, so basically, uh, we realize that uh, there are some substal phase, substal phase transformations that leave to a different space group than the, the pristine one. And the most interesting feature is that uh, instead of having a vanadium 4 plus uh, oxidation state for the, the given compounds, we realize that uh, at the end of charge, uh, for the sodium one composition, there is a disproportionation uh, feature that occurs. Very interestingly, we determined from the uh, X-ray diffraction analysis, plus also from uh, X-ray absorption analysis, that we don't have a single vanadium four plus on crystallographic side, but we have vanadium three and vanadium five plus coexisting in the same. Uh, powder in the same material with these two, uh, two octahedra that share a cone, the fluorine cone. So this is some sort of so-called disproportionation, and we were able to identify it for this compound. What we did as well was to investigate the, the structural properties of this compound under various conditions in terms of uh, electrochemical cycling. Thanks to the very bright source in the Alba synchrotron and to our operando cells, which uh, perform pretty well, we were able to cycle this compound up to 25C in the synchrotron and identify indeed that the phase transformations still occur even at this very, very high rate and with intermediate phases spotting here. We were also able to, we identify very early uh, as soon as 20, 15, that uh, we could try to, to implement this material in real cells. And this was done in the French task force with Professor Tarascon and Laurence, Patrice Simon, Mathieu Morcret, et cetera. And uh, with the CEA who was able to build uh, real cells uh, for us, with us, and uh, to identify that in this, this uh, structure, this compound was able to, to very, very stable and per and in particular, and the very fast rates. So this uh, generated the creation of uh, the company Tayamat, which is uh, clearly identified now as an interesting player in the world of uh, sodium ion batteries. Uh, as we said uh, several times, as, as uh, Jerry clearly mentioned, uh, at this stage, uh, the NVPF that uh, Tiamat is using clearly makes very, very highly powerful batteries. But I'm happy to announce uh, that uh, Tayamat is also now working on uh, higher energy density materials with layered oxides that will be developed in a, in a near future. Now I will move to the second part of my talk dedicated to Nasicon type uh, electrodes. Based again on vanadium, but uh, as I will show you, based also on some extra elements that we try to in incorporate into this structure. Uh, around the Lassicon, many of you probably know that it has a very, very high structural stability. This is somehow what I do like a lot within uh, polyanoic materials and phosphates. The structures yeah, those they are very, very stable for long-term electrochemical cycling. We can play with uh, many chemical substitutions into this uh, framework, so that really allows the voltage monitoring through the inductive effect, as many people know. And this uh, is also quite fascinating in terms of crystal chemistry, where we observe many order disorder phenomena on the sodium sublattice. Not to mention as well that um, several of these materials have been tested or are identified, are studied for sodium solicite batteries, both for the cathode or anode part, but also using nasicon as the solid electrolyte in between. So yes, indeed, many groups are tackling problems, tackling uh, studies about sodium ion transport in the nasicons uh, with different kinds of modeling, of course, different, different kinds of 
electrochemical tests with uh, nasicons both at the cathode side and the electrolyte. This is clearly a trend and we see many groups and progress in, in this field. And of course, we have to acknowledge that uh, the nasicon structure itself was invented uh, many, many years ago by John Goodenough when he was looking for solid electrolytes to be used with sodium sulfur uh, batteries. We did a bit of uh, research, quite a bit actually, uh, on solid state batteries using nasicon electrodes and cathodes and electrolytes. And quite a bit uh, of time ago or so, we were able to build this uh, kind of uh, solid state batteries using uh, NZSP as a sandwich electrolyte assembled by uh, spark plasma sintering and to build a, a symmetrical cell with uh, NVP, both at the anode and the, and the cathode side. Uh, the performance were satisfactory, I would say, not, not to mention here that uh, these were measured at 200 degrees Celsius, but still feasible and uh, several groups are working on trying to improve these numbers in uh, solid state batteries that uh, do not contain any sulfur and that are purely made on, out of oxides. And in this case, uh, with the NVP on both sides, it's a full nasicon structure and uh, solid state batteries. So <clears throat> what I really like, what I really enjoy, what we you have to figure out about the nasicon structure is that this allows for extensive uh, chemical substitution. We can put basically whatever we want on the octahedral sites here with many, many different transition metals from iron to vanadium, titanium, niobium, manganese, chromium. And uh, then depending on the oxidation state of these elements, and depending also on the anion, here I mentioned only uh, formulas with PO4, but PO4 can also be SO4, can be SiO4. So then depending on these numbers, we can adjust the number of sodium ions into the cathodes. So we have basically electrodes where there is no sodium, and BTI is a good example. And we can end up with cathodes also with uh, four sodium ions. So really a very nice playground to identify different kinds of uh, electrodes. We can play with uh, <clears throat> different redox couples that operate on these materials. So different redox couples will make, will build electrodes that will function at different voltage versus sodium. So this is somehow very useful for monitoring the voltage you will obtain and also to create, as it has been done by some companies in the US, to, to eventually uh, envisage uh, aqueous uh, batteries, sodium batteries based on nasicon electrodes. Many, many people worked uh, all over the world and for the last 30 or even 40 years on many different electrodes. This somehow, this graph somehow uh, gathers many of the interesting materials that were uh, investigated from uh, iron sulfate here, as you can see, that uh, was investigated by Montiram in particular. Uh, from the NATI2 PO4 three times that was discovered by Claude Delmas a long time ago. Uh, from the chromium phosphate, the highest voltage obtained in the Nasicon framework by Atsuo Yamada. And uh, also a lot of work had been done uh, quite a while ago also from uh, by Palani Balaya uh, in Singapore, showing the very high rate capabilities of this uh, NVP type uh, electrodes based on the Nasicon structure. <clears throat> so we played quite a bit with many of these compounds and uh, depending on the transition metal element you put with aluminum, with versus uh, vanadium, I would say, uh, we can have uh, many different properties, many different operating redox voltages. We can substitute vanadium by aluminum here. We can substitute vanadium with titanium, with iron, as I will show a little bit later, and uh, with manganese. In these uh, two cases here, because we can substitute with iron two plus and manganese two plus, uh, we can end up with a cathode containing four sodium ions, which is indeed very important if we want to increase the energy density and the capacity of these uh, nasicon electrodes. I will focus my, my next 15 minutes uh, on the NVP system. And uh, just to illustrate what we recently found on this uh, 
very highly investigated system in the in the world that looks uh, very simple uh, nvp here and that's what people prepare uh, can be either oxidized uh, by sodium extraction at uh, around 3.4 volts versus sodium towards anyone but it can also be used uh, reversibly uh, as a negative electrode uh, working at 1.6 volt versus sodium so somehow this shows you the feasibility of operating on more than one electron per vanadium on from NA1 to NA4 in a single NVP electrode that can play at both sides a negative or a positive side for sodium ion battery so this system apparently very simple uh, gave us some very nice surprise recently uh, gave us but also some to some others we have to acknowledge that uh, some people uh, already identified that uh, in this uh, apparently boring redox plateau here, some intermediate phases would appear, you see, uh, the, somehow at the middle of the extraction of sodium from Na3. Uh, this was uh, even more clearly identified and described by uh, our colleagues from Russia in the Antipov group, which uh, from Na3 here, uh, to anyone here identify the appearance of a new phase at uh, mid mid charge so this was really intriguing for us and we we worked a lot at the alba synchrotron to try to identify this uh, weird intermediate phase and the slow rate at equilibrium condition uh, we go basically from the na3 to the na1 phase through a two phase reaction that occurs at 3.4 volt versus sodium uh, but uh, if uh, the, the battery is cycled at a higher rate and in the different conditions, we indeed also saw the appearance of this uh, Na2 phase at, uh, at mid-charge. So this was really a surprise for us and a confirmation from what had been published by the Russian group. And uh, <clears throat> then we undertook many other uh, studies, studies with... Uh, upon cycling at uh, different rates and uh, for extensive cycling up to the sixth cycle here where we always saw the, the existence of this intermediate phase between NA3 and NA1 and definitely it is there it is there and uh, we could uh, by carefully uh, monitoring our electrochemistry we could indeed uh, isolate this phase isolate where you can see here that the diffraction peaks of this na2 phase that basically had never been really fully observed before and determined uh, occurs in between the na3 pristine one and the na1 pristine uh, oxidate uh, oxidized one so from the very high quality of this uh, synchrotron X-ray diffraction pattern, we were able to determine the crystal structure of this new Na2V2 PO4310 phase. Uh, <clears throat> it was a little bit challenging, and uh, my colleague uh, Jean-Noël Chota with uh, Sung Kyu Park, our student and our collaborators, worked very hard in trying to figure out uh, the real crystal structure observed, uh, we ended up with uh, two models that we couldn't really decide on to which was the exact right one, with two models where one of them showing uh, sodium vacancies in one crystallographic site, and uh, when the other model shows a full disorder of sodium in the crystallographic sites, while the two specific lantern units of the Nasicon fr framework are oxidized to vanadium 4 plus on one side and to vanadium 3 plus uh, on the other side. So this is uh, pretty fascinating to see that uh, in a apparent very flat voltage plateau, we indeed have a crystallized well-defined phase just in the middle, in the between the Na2, Na3 and Na1 phase. <clears throat> Many people, I think, have been trying to, to get further in NVP and to try to fully extract the the third sodium you know i was just talking about any from any three to any one here that gives an operating of voltage of 3.4 but for uh, capacity is still limited to around 110 120 million per gram the ideal case would be to be able to reversibly extract the third sodium towards v2 pure for three times which to my knowledge, nobody really uh, succeeded in doing uh, recently. This is a, 
a figure taken from uh, this paper published in 2014, but which is about modeling. And uh, indeed, uh, the operating voltage will be 4.6 volts, but we never succeeded in getting V2 pure for three times electrochemically. Uh, very recently, uh, we uh, we made a nice discovery, I think, together with my colleagues, uh, which we patented and that I'm happy to disclose today. Uh, it's that uh, indeed uh, conventional Na3 V2 pure for three times uh, works at 3.4 volts versus sodium. And we were able by some tricks that I cannot completely reveal uh, today. Uh, to increase substantially the operating voltage of this uh, Nasicon electrode uh, towards a 3.6 volt average versus sodium. Besides the intermediate phases that I demonstrated earlier, uh, here we have a full solid solution uh, from the beginning to the end with two waves, okay, but uh, a solid solution occurring. And interestingly as well is that the this new material here, new composition, leads to a smaller expansion and contraction upon uh, electrochemical cycling. So this is pretty interesting in terms of uh, applications. I will uh, move on to the last uh, small part of my talk towards the, um, the new studies we recently performed around uh, the substitution of one vanadium uh, by one iron to lead to the Na4 FEV PO4 three time uh, cathodes. Uh, several groups, including uh, co workers with John Goodenough, have been working on substituting vanadium by different elements, such as manganese, uh, to lead to these very impressive uh, electrochemical properties when the operating voltage is limited to 3.7 volt versus sodium. And we indeed also worked on that together with uh, some a group in, in Russia as well to be to demonstrate that uh, three sodium could be indeed extracted from this NAMNVPO for three time uh, material. So this leads to a substantial uh, increase of the capacity, but this also leads to a substantial uh, change in the electrochemical uh, voltage composition data and curves and shapes with a very strong uh, structural rearrangement upon the last uh, extra sodium extraction uh, phenomenon. We, besides this manganese substitution, we worked uh, actively on the iron type some compounds and we first prepared uh, this new compound in a three FEV PO4 three times. So it's rather easy to prepare, but the crystal chemistry is not that trivial and it shows as many sodium three containing materials, uh, very nice uh, sodium and vacancy ordering that leads to very complicated uh, superstructure with a huge unit cell and monoclinic distortion. So we prepare this material easily and we tried uh, as well then to prepare the Na4 FEV compounds with uh, reduced iron. Uh, which uh, we never succeeded to do by uh, simple solid state chemistry. We succeeded, uh, however, to prepare an A4-FEV uh, formula by uh, chemical uh, sodiation of the Na3-FEV that we had prepared uh, before. So indeed, uh, we were able to obtain it uh, as a very pure phase uh, with uh, all the sodium sites completely fully occupied uh, normally because we have uh, all the NA1 and NA2 crystallographic sites occupied in this compound. And we were able to confirm as well from uh, Mossbauer spectroscopy that uh, indeed iron was uh, reduced at the two plus oxidation state into this, uh, into this material. So we have a compound NA4 FEV that is uh, obtained uh, electrochemically. And, uh, and chemically by uh, sodium uh, sodiation, by chemical sodiation. And we were able to indeed uh, determine that uh, the environment around iron, the environment around vanadium looked very similar from the X-ray point of view, but we were able to separate the, the respective contributions from exafs and determine that indeed we had uh, iron two plus and vanadium three plus in the same cathode. 
The electrochemistry is uh, pretty fascinating. It shows uh, three extraction phenomena up to 4.4 volts Celsius sodium with uh, the progressive oxidation of the manganese, uh, vanadium and iron. And you can see that basically uh, the phenomenon is not completely reversible as we have only two phenomena in the subsequent uh, discharge. Uh, this shows a rather high structural stability of a, of a cycling with many intermediate phases occurring upon sodium extraction and insertion. And we were able, thanks to uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy, thanks to Mosbauer spectroscopy, to fully determine the mechanism of sodium extraction from these compounds. At the end of charge, uh, very interestingly, we were able to identify, again, a very short vanadium oxygen vanadyl type bonds uh, at, that occur at the end of charge and that are mostly responsible for the structural irreversibility upon the next uh, discharge. So I will conclude uh, about the NACI phases just to remind everyone that indeed this uh, structural family that has been identified for very fast ion transport as a solid electrolyte is also a very good uh, uh, fast rate uh, material for cathodes in the sodium ion batteries. Uh, <clears throat> the crystal structure uh, allows for um, tuning the operating voltage towards the application we may uh, wish. And uh, many groups now have been focusing on trying to extract three electrons per formula unit, in particular playing with manganese and vanadium. And this uh, is not completely uh, solved in terms of structural reversibility and long-term cycling, but this is uh, one path to, to take on these uh, materials. I will end up by uh, thanking my deep uh, good friends and uh, strong collaborators in uh, in Bordeaux, in particular, in Amiens, of course, my colleagues uh, Vincent and Jean-Noël, and uh, in the different facilities such as the Alba Synchrotron with Francois. And much of this work has been performed by Sunkyu Park, by Long Nguyen and Matteo Bianchini, who are no longer with us because they, have, they are doing a great job elsewhere now. So I will thank you for your attention, and I'm sorry again for this uh, interruption of my internet access. Kuchan, thank you very much uh, for that deep dive into, and, yeah. into the sodium ion cathode crystal chemistry. So we have time for a few questions um, from the audience. So maybe let me get started. The yeah. first question comes from the use of two electron and three electron redox um, in many of the poly anions that you showed, uh, which I think shows the versatility and stability of, of the poly anion structure. Um, the one question from the audience is, how does the electronic transport alter as you go through these many redox um, in, the, in the transition metals? It basically doesn't. Uh, very, 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 uh, oh, we don't have much knowledge about that because basically nobody really took care in precisely measuring the electronic transport, but we don't see any difference and there should not really be any difference. You know, the octahedra are all isolated from each other, really, and they are completely, there is no corner age or phase sharing between any of the transition metal octahedra. So that's a strong point, you know, to just figure out that basically there is super small electron transport. The transport is mostly ionic. So this is a difficulty, right? In terms of the, <laughs> as for the cathode in the, but you know, carbon coating, ball milling, advanced coatings on this is sufficient to bring the electrons, but Intrinsically, in the structure of the nasicons, electron transport is not modified by having different elements. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is very interesting. I think another way of saying it is that the electronic transport is generally very poor in these materials. Um, and through extrinsic methods, such as carbon coating, you're able to mitigate it. Yeah, but yeah. nonetheless, I still find it quite fascinating that um, the MVPF has such incredible rate capability um, 
despite some of these shortcomings uh, on the intrinsic uh, electronic conductivity of the material. Uh, do you think this is result yeah, from... the, for, the, for the NVPF, it is slightly different. Uh, you have uh, you have shared uh, corners in, in a given uh, bioctahedral unit, but the electronic connectivity is not much bigger than the, for the nasicons. Uh, yeah, really, the sodium, you know, the sodium takes it all in terms of it. It moves so fast that then, then, then you, somehow I don't know if we can say that it would compensate the poor electronic connectivity. But yes. The sodium does it. And uh, <clears throat> the fact that you have very small electron transport is the reason why you will have so well-defined redox couples positions. You know, They're really, titanium 4 plus 3 plus is always at the same place <laughs> for a given phosphate. So if, and if you mix titanium and vanadium, you will have both couples. They will not mix somehow. You know, the, the electrons are really step-by-step -step into mm -hmm. the different... Uh, and this is because you don't have electron transport between between the octahedra. Yeah. yeah, it's a very interesting system. The next question um, is on the um, the two phase behavior in the plateau. You observed additional phase transition that did not manifest in an extra plateau. So I'm. This question is for me actually. Um, it, I think it's very interesting. That means the energy difference between the phase must be very small. Um, such that the voltage is almost the same. Is is that your interpretation as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it has been uh, definitely, and it has been even uh, modeled somehow by, by DFT, by Pierre Emmanuel Canepa, with whom we have been working hard on that. So this is really such a small difference, you know. So we're trying to find some ways of seeing it <laughs> electrochemically there should be some signatures somewhere somehow but uh, with classical galvanostatic data like that you see just a very boring flat plateau uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah what is fascinating is this kind of behavior same for nvpf happens in materials that show very very high rate capabilities you know you have those, all those many different and I think it has been mentioned in very old papers by Atsuo Yamada, you know, that when you have this sort of transient phases, this really favors fast uh, electrochemical operation between the cathodes, right? And somehow, maybe this, the existence of this intermediate phase is maybe one of the reasons why we can go so fast from NA3 to NA1 through this NA intermediate one. Same, yeah. for, same for NVPF, actually. This reminds me of and, uh, some some of the models on LFP as well. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. On this the is interfacial transport. Yeah. This is uh, when I mentioned about Akuto uh, Yamada. It was because uh, what he did on LFP, yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> Which yeah, yes, you were there, of course. I forget the name. Is it a Domino Cascade? I forgot the name that was coined for this interfacial transport um, between phases. Yeah, the Domino Cascade model was uh, was presented and. Uh, invented somehow by Claude Delmas and Laurence Kroganek, uh, but it's not exactly what uh, Yamada was talking about, yes. Great question. So I think now, because we, we only have a little bit of time left, I suggest we uh, now have a discussion also with Jerry. Uh, so Jerry, if I can ask you to uh, come back. <clears throat> Um, so typically in our seminar, at the end, we, we try to coalesce the perspectives a bit and I think today we are very honored to have both the academic and the industrial perspective and everything in between. So I thought we can devote, um, you know, the next 15 or minute or so to talk about intersection between the two. Um, and I thought maybe I'll just start with um, a, a question from my side, which is, you know, Christian, in, in, in the many of the materials you have presented and also in yours, Jerry, um, if you were to draw a line between the fully charged and fully discharged state and then calculate the average slope, uh, for many of the sodium compounds, it's quite a bit um, larger in terms of the slope, uh, meaning that as the battery operates, uh, it may have the same energy density, but the range of the voltage is greater. And I, I wanted to ask maybe, Jerry, for you to comment on practicality here. So as you increase the average tilt, <laughs> whether it's through multiple plateaus or other things, does that um, present any commercialization challenges when it comes to integration in the system? And also, has the electronics changed over the past, say, 10 years um, 
to better allow, say, uh, car manufacturers um, to, to work with this uh, wider voltage range? Mm. That's, a, that's a good question, uh, Will. The, 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 the voltage slope in a, in a layered oxide hard carbon, you, it's, a, it's a double hit, right? When you compare it with, say, LFP and graphite, which are both very flat voltage profiles. Well, if you looked at if you look at the hard carbon profile, right, it's it's composed generally of kind of two two aspects. There's a slopey part and there's a flat part. And then on top of that, the the layered oxide is generally sloping. It depends a bit on what transition metals you use, clearly. But if you go for something like we've got, which is a, which is operating on the nickel two plus four plus couple, it's generally more sloping than an NMC or an NCA. So we end up with our voltage range is from fully charged in the full cell, 4.2, fully discharged is somewhere between 1.5 and 1 volt. It's, it's a long voltage range. We, we would prefer not to have that wheel, right? Because that, that kind of hits a few things, but, but, but it makes it more difficult in terms of the electronics and the BMS, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But... If again, if you look at it, you don't lose, let's say in an application you cut off at 2.5 volts, right? Cell voltage on discharge. There's not a huge amount of energy below 2.5 volts because the very aspect is it's at a low voltage. So, so we overcome a lot of it by just cutting off at something like 2.5 volts. We would, we would prefer though for a lot of applications to have to have it less sloping. I know mean, that's a long would, answer to your question, but. Yeah, I would mention the, indeed your question, uh, William, that uh, this is true for the layered oxides. And I think it's true for both lithium and sodium <laughs> layered oxide. For the polyanions, you have basically, most of the time, much better defined plateaus, I would say. Eh? Let's say, it's the case, for instance, for NAVPO4F, very flat plateau at very high voltage. And you don't have these voltage uh, ranges. So it's not, I don't think it's due to the sodium chemistry, it's uh, to the structure. And the structure is layered versus polyanions in this case, yeah. to answer. Yeah. You, you, you know, though, Christian, you know, a lot, a lot of it, it's, it's the combination of the, the cathode performance and the anode performance, right? So, you know, I mentioned in my talk, well, about there's a lot of work, you know, when we first started commercializing, we, we basically just took commercial hard carbons. Right? And commercial hard carbons were developed for the lithium ion industry, not for the sodium ion industry. And what those had, the way they were produced meant that more than 50% of the, the, the discharge capacity was in the sloping region, right? Which is not what you would choose for an energy application. But now we know what those mechanisms of insertion and, and extraction are in the hard carbon, such that if you, if you make the hard carbon in, in a particular way, you can have pretty well all plateau, right? So you take away the slopey part and that just increases the two things, both the average operating discharge voltage of the full cell and the slope, less slopey uh, discharge profile. So you can overcome some of these by, by chemical engineering of the, of the hard carbon. Christian, just to come back to your point um, about um, the slopiness and, and what is the cause of it, the, uh, my feeling is, uh, at least in the nascent constructors, usually you have to employ more than one electron redox. And I think intrinsically, um, you will have to deal with the two voltages there. Um, yeah. But I, I think you're right. Um, there should be no specific dependence on lithium versus sodium. I think it's just the, the use of the nascent constructure uh, generally requires more than one yeah. electron box. And that yeah, is exactly. something in this that case, you have. You have uh, in this case, you have to play with more than 1.5 volt difference from the V3, V4 to the V3, V2, for instance, couples, yes. So coming from the chemistry side, Christian, I mean, this is a very challenging task um, of using multi-electron redox, but not wanting them to be too different. Um, yes. do, you, do you see also tricks um, on the chemistry side that we can play to bring the redox potential a bit closer together? Um, I, I, 
I've been thinking for, about this for a long time and couldn't find a good answer to it, but I was uh, thought I would poke poke your brain. What happens in the NVPF? And, and I don't know if we can do that for the NAS sequence, but what happens in the v NVPF is kind of fascinating. You know, you have Valium 3 plus in this bilantan unit, but then you end up with VO, the vanadyl O2 plus, which is very different than V3 plus, I mean, you would say, and that ends up to a slightly different voltage. And if you have these two units, so, and VO2 plus can be seen somehow as V4 plus, <laughs> You know, for the NVPF O2, basically you start with, uh, you would say with Vanadium 4 plus, right? But you have basically the same operating voltage than the NVPF, which is Vanadium 3 plus. So there's a lot uh, to do still here. And uh, maybe it answers a little bit of your question, but we haven't really seen that in the Nasicon yet because the structure is different. And, and the creation of this very short vanadyl VO bond uh, really is detrimental for the Nasicon uh, cyclability, which is not for the NVPF. Well, well, Jerry, maybe the biphasic could be approached toward this, and it cannot be done in a single crystal structure. Maybe it can be done in two to um, to bring things a bit more closely together. Possible, yeah, possible. You know, we've got the same issues as the vanadium in the NA NAVPO4F in the that we're, we're going nickel two plus to nickel four plus, right? When we when we charge and then four plus to two plus in discharge. So it's so it's it's a it's a it's a multi-electron transfer on the nickel, which is good, right? It's very it's very efficient in terms of how much nickel you use in, in the cathode material, but you just end up with this very wide voltage range. But it's it's a it's a tough one to overcome because there's not that many other transition metals you can use. We don't really want to go down the route of some of you using some of them like cobalt, for instance, or chromium. So you tend to keep on coming back to a combination of nickel, iron, manganese, and maybe copper. These are the ones you generally use in layered oxide chemistry. And there's and the, the biphase it gives you another degree of freedom because P2 and O3, for instance, like we use, are for the same redox couple operate at slightly different voltages, but it's but it's not enough to smooth out the profile completely. Jerry, on the biphasic approach, um, and I know that uh, blended has been explored uh, very extensively in industry over the past 10 years. Um, do you, are you concerned um, as they do in blended electro differential degradation between the two phases? Um, everything yeah. looks good initially, but how does things yeah. look later on? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. You've got, you've got to be, you've got to be aware of that all the time. Bill. Yeah. Um, I would say that, like I said before, though, that the, the synergistic effect we see is that Physical mixtures are not the same as chemical mixtures because of because of the integrase. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a marked difference. It's maybe like a a factor of two or three in terms of the cycle life. It's a mm -hmm. it's a big difference. You know, we naively thought when we started this work that hey, if you we know that P two materials are generally good for power applications, right? Because of the prismatic um, uh, you know position of the sodium. And the O3 had higher specific energies, but you know, were better for energy applications, not so good for power. So we thought, well, in an ideal situation, we would have um, we could have you know a, a P2 silo and an O3 silo. And if someone came along and said, look, I want this particular application with this power and energy requirement, you could just mix those two and well, you could do that, but it's better to make it chemically. That's what we found out because of the intergross and the, and the synergy, synergy between the two. But, but the, 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 the beauty of it is that, as I said to you earlier, you can take a precursor mix, treat it differently, and end up with mixed phases of O3 and P2 with markedly different amounts of each with no impurity phases. It's very powerful. So that gives you can in, in theory give you a power, a power cathode material and, a, and an energy cathode material from the same precursor mix. It's actually, it's actually pretty good. I agree. 
Well, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, Christian and Jerry, both of you are involved in commercialization of sodium on batteries cushion and your work with Tiamat and of course, Jerry with Feridion. Um, you know, as I, I mentioned after Jerry's talk, I think in terms of the academic side, say research side, the results are extremely encouraging. So I, I wonder if we can close by talking a bit about what are the remaining gaps needed, um, either it's fundamental or more on the development side or scale up side, that is really needed, a sort of an honest uh, look at the remaining mm -hmm. challenges uh, mm -hmm. to make this happen. And maybe I can ask Christian to, to start. <clears throat> if we are talking about sodium ion batteries versus lithium ion batteries, uh, one of the very important thing is that the foreseen cost, right? And uh, the cost or the, the cost per kilowatt, uh, cost per kilowatt delivered, whatever. And so the challenge is to identify lower cost for, for, for me, lower cost cathodes, uh, I would say. I think Jerry mentioned that as well. Uh, that means trying to move uh, towards iron manganese uh, materials and stabilize them. I think this will be a must for to make sure that sodium cathodes will be of very high interest uh, for massive batteries, for instance, for these kind of things. Yeah, you need cheaper batteries because as Jerry mentioned that uh, one of the main uh, competitor to sodium ion technology was LFP. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so somehow the sodium ion technology is comparing their own performances versus LFP, which is hard to beat in some cases, but which for in terms of energy density could be beaten. Uh, and one of the challenges that Jerry maybe didn't mention too much in his talk is about the for the layered oxides, the, the stability in a humid atmosphere or air about the layered cathodes. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is also of a, a big challenge. Myself, I'm not able to address it because I don't work on layered oxides, but uh, maybe Jerry can comment on that. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a, it's a, it's a good point. Again, the, the, the ambient sensitivity depends on what transition metal combination you use. Christian, as you know, and uh, there are things that you can do. If you, if you look at if you look at an as-made nickel-based O3 layered oxide, then the open circuit voltage of the as-made material versus sodium comes out to be about uh, 2.6 volts versus the sodium reference. If you know anything about it, you'll know that's very marginal sensit moisture sensitivity, ambient sensitivity. But you can shift that with the right combination of substitutions. Maybe I'll leave it at that. You probably know, I'm sure you know that, Christian, right? You, there's certain things you can do. But go back to your original point, though, Will, about what we need to do moving forward. Is I always say to the guys at Faradian, right? When, when, you, when you start to try and commercialize a new battery chemistry, right? There, there always used to be the three things you had to check, the three boxes you had to check, right? You always knew I had to check the boxes of, of performance, right? Cost and safety, right? All those three things you had to check. There was no compromise, right? But, but now you've got to add in sustainability. You, if you're trying to license or develop a new, a new chemistry, you have to check that box as well. So I think moving forward, well, I think I mentioned it in my talk. I think if so, if, if sodium ion batteries could move to a, a zero nickel layered oxide cathode, we would now have squared the circle, right? We would have, we would have a completely sustainable high performance cell chemistry. It'd be beautiful, right? It was based on iron and manganese. You've got, it's low cost, it's high performing, it's sustainable, it's, it's kind of got everything. That's easy to say and difficult to achieve, but it, 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 it's only that one delta that needs to be needs to be done, right? I say only; it's not easy, but but it's got better opportunities, I think, than pretty well any other cell chemistry. Yeah, uh, Jerry, I completely agree, and I think um, you know, I, I'm. It's very we're very fortunate to have you both here because you came 
uh, from the the very original days of LFP. Uh, yeah. You know, if we look at the drivers for LFP's resurgence, is really safety and cost, right? Um, yeah, and that delivered. Right. And the yeah. technology hasn't changed very much no. beyond no. those. Um, do, you know, do you know, Will, I said this to Christian before, right? When, when Valence first introduced its first LFP product, right? This is 2002, right? We were literally doing cartwheels and we got to 100 watt hour per kilogram. That was our target, right? Now you see cells that are like 200. It's the same chemistry. It's the same graphite LFP. And, and, and it's just moved on because people have done a great job in engineering the cell. They've done a fantastic job. And when you see it now, when you when you're dealing it with with the new, you know, when you're doing silicon graphite composite anodes, they're talking about two twenty five watt hours per kilogram. I never would have believed it. Well, I would never have believed that was possible. Two twenty is crazy, right? Yeah. We were happy at one hundred when we first did the uh, the work at Valence. So, great, great engineering, a little bit at a time, and you fantastic add them. engineering. You have to say, right? We we did the chemistry maybe, and they did. Great job on the engineering, you know, large format. Great, great job, right? No, well, you know, maybe I can paint my own dream. Um, <laughs> you know, given today's lithium carbonate, lithium hydroxide pricing, I think if you can simply replace the lithium in lithium iron phosphate with sodium, <laughs> then that, that, that that's a done deal, right? Everybody will do yeah, it. Yeah. But that's it's not so it, simple. It, it, it just doesn't work for you, you know. <laughs> Christian knows it's better than anyone, right? It just, it goes against you. Nature goes against you when you just try and make that by solid state. You know, you have to do it. You have to do it by a different route, you know. But it, uh, forget but, maybe. Uh, the, there's still room in Crystal and, and we, we, I'm still optimistic in finding new materials and new properties, etc. You know, this NA2, okay. And then I, I showed you that we have a new compound where that operates at higher with without any extra elements than N, N A, V, and P. So you can play with many things to, to try to change the electrochemical properties. There's still room for the crystal chemist. That's fun and fun. And then the engineers will make it also work better. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And we will not end today's talk by asking everyone to comment on the timeline. The technology will come soon at some point. Um, but I think the optimism is, is really high, uh, at, at least in this seminar. Um, Christian and Jerry, I want to thank you both uh, for taking the time. I know it's late over there. Um, and I, uh, I hope to see you both soon in person somewhere. Sounds good. Thanks, thank you. Will. Thank you very much. And Justin, can I have the closing slides? And uh, we do have one more seminar uh, before the winter holidays. Um, our final seminar, which is two weeks from today, will feature Deborah Rollison uh, from the Naval Research Lab and Veronica Augustine from North Carolina State. And they will talk about aqueous energy storage uh, for grid um, storage applications. And again, thanks from Stanford for everyone joining today. I hope you learned about sodium ion as much as I have. And please stay connected with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>